This morning's passage doesn't seem like good news, but we're going to talk about the good news of Easter. It's Easter morning. Um, if you're not aware, if you're not regular to this church, God is moving here. So what we're about to talk about in terms of the resurrection story, we are witnessing it happening here in our church. As people are coming to faith, people are coming back to the Lord, uh, people who have walked with Him for a long time are having their hearts softened. God is breaking our hearts for the things that break His. This is what the gospel is all about. And we want to be a church, don't we? We want to be a church that's excited about the things that God's excited about, that are broken for the things that God has broken about, and that are vocal about the good news to the people that, that He's placed around us. So we're going to do that. I want to look at this story that is... Uh, in Matthew 27. And, and what I want to do is I want to just walk through the characters that are key players in this story, because this is a story that for many you're familiar with. Uh, it's one of the parts of the story that we don't often spend enough time thinking about. Um, but let's, let's look through these characters one at a time, and I want to invite you to think about the character. Uh, we're going to look at what is going on in their heart at, as they engage the story of Jesus. And I want to invite you to reflect on yourself. Where do you see this character at work in you? We're going to put ourselves into the Bible story. We like to think of ourselves as the, the poor, nice people that Jesus died for. We would never do the things that the people in the story did. But a lot of the time, we're just as guilty as the people that we read about. So let's look at number one. We're going to look at Pontius Pilate. So it says in the story, when Pilate saw, this is, uh, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. Pontius Pilate it historically is known as a cruel and harsh man. He was not a friend of the Jews. He was a man that was out to destroy Israel at all costs. He was the Roman ruler in place at that time. And compared to many of the rulers, he was harsh. He was power hungry. Uh, he was guarding himself and out to get anyone that came against him. He was not a nice man, power hungry. Uh, he was also a man that lived by fear of man. So we see in other parts of the story, we see it in the Luke account, um, when Pilate is faced with this trial before Jesus, uh, uh, Luke lets us know that they bring uh, Jesus to Pilate and say, hey, would you examine this man? And Pilate's like, I ain't touching this. Uh, is he not something connected to the air that Herod is over? Let's send him to Herod and have Herod deal with it, because I don't want to deal with it. So he gets sent to Herod. Herod decides, this guy's innocent. Send him back to Pilate. Pilate's like, this guy's innocent. And you're at this point in the story in the middle where you've got this horrible moment where Pilate is declaring all the way through, like, Jesus is innocent. Uh, what happened? His wife comes and lets him know Jesus is innocent. Uh, he's had two or three court cases that prove Jesus is innocent. And at this point in the story, this horrible piece happens where he, he, he decides that it was getting too much. It says, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. So Pilate, knowing Jesus was innocent, knowing he was uh, not guilty of the things that he was being accused of in the face of pressure. What will people say that this guy's claiming to be the king of the Jews? If I side with him, I'm now an enemy of Caesar. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my position. What's going to happen if this crowd can't calm down? They're going to overthrow me. I'm going to lose face. I'm going to lose my power. I'm going to lose my position. Fear of man stopped this man from doing what he knew to be right. What should he have done? This man is innocent, says Herod. This man is innocent, says Pilate. You're warned in a dream, says his wife. He should have said, okay, there is no evidence, so we're releasing this guy. But he gave in to the peer pressure. He gave in to fear of man. He protected the position that he had. And in that place, failed to protect the savior of the world that had come. So how many of you have been in situations where you have an opportunity to share the gospel? But you're worried, if I speak this out right now, I could lose my job. If I speak this out right now, this person is probably going to think I'm ridiculous. They, they don't realize that I'm a person of faith. They're going to reject me. How many of us are like Pontius Pilate? When push comes to shove, knowing everything we know about Jesus, all the historical facts that we have, 
when push comes to shove, our power, our position, and our fear of man cause us to keep our mouths shut and to placate the crowd round about us with what we do and say. I have to say in this one too, with, with Pilate, these moments of Jesus is innocent. I don't know what to do with this man. He's done nothing that I can see. Pilate was known as a cruel and harsh man who opposed the Jews. So for a cruel, harsh Jewish hater to have this criminal brought in front of him, listen to his story and go, yeah, this guy doesn't deserve this. Like he knows, he knows the truth. And yet he allows his hunger for power and his fear of man to keep him away from acting the way God wants him to act. The second character in the story is often overlooked. I think it's important that we we bring in this lady, known only in Scripture as Pilate's wife. There are some other documents that give us a name. We don't know if they're true or not, so I'm not going to say. But what I love about this point in the story is, in a story that's filled with male characters other than the crowd, the writer highlights one woman who happens to be the only person in the story whose heart is at all open to the Lord. I think that's a beautiful little insight in here. You've got Pilate's wife, spiritually sensitive. While Pilate's sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sends this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today because of a dream about him. I find myself wondering what the dream was. She wakes up from a dream, and she is in anguish. She feels an inner torture. She's, she's scared. Something about the dream was real enough and horrible enough that she goes to the leader of the nation and barges in and says, you have to go into the meeting and you have to give them the news about the dream I just had. How many of you (laughs) would be bold enough to be like, hey, can you go in and uh, and interrupt the CEO right now and just tell him I had this dream last night? It's kind of important. He really needs to listen to it. Uh, We wouldn't do it. But something was compelling enough for this woman Uh, that she knew something was wrong. And so she breaks protocol. She sends people uh, with a message and says, don't do it. I am suffering because of what this man has done. You know, in Greek Orthodox tradition, they've actually elevated uh, this this woman in in their church tradition. And they have other documents and, and traditional stories that say this woman goes on and gives her life to Jesus and becomes a leader within the church. And so they, they call her a saint and they celebrate her. Um, But I think there's some beautiful principle in here about the role of women. I'm going to say, men in the room, you know, we can be stubborn. We can be pig-headed. We can be a little slow in the uptake at times. Women are often, not always, but women are often more sensitive and more open and more aware of what God is doing and saying. They're more relationally driven, and so they find it easier to connect with the God that loves us. And so I think we have a duty in the church, men, to listen to the voice of the women in our life who have many times demonstrated a spiritual sensitivity, come with a heart that cares and wants to warn. So I wanted to add that in uh, just because I think she's an important piece and they didn't have to put this in the story. Why did they put it there? They wanted us to understand the gravity of what she felt and they wanted to understand the seriousness of Pilate's crime by ignoring the very message that he was given. The third group of people that we see in this story are religious leaders who are blinded by their religious lenses. This is so easy for us. All the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans to have Jesus executed. They were scheming. They were planning how to take him out. And then uh, Matthew lets us know it was out of self-interest. The word here is envy, jealousy that they handed Jesus over to him. You had these religious leaders. What was their job? Their job was to lead people in obedience to the covenant. Their job wasn't help people to follow the law. That was a part of it. Their job was to bring people back to the covenant with God and how they were supposed to live that out. These were people that were waiting for the Messiah, and everything they did was to help the people prepare for the arrival of the Messiah. But somehow in their pursuing the things of God, in their study of Torah, in the traditions that they had built up, they developed these lenses 
that they looked at when they opened the law, that they looked at when they interacted with one another, that they looked at when they saw people out there who were considered other. And instead of pointing people back to Jesus, they, they created this lens that stopped them from seeing the Messiah when he was in their midst. How many of you have heard someone talk about God moving in their life and you dismiss what they say because the experience they had doesn't fit the paradigm that you have in your mind? How many of you write off what other churches do in the city because the way they do the things in the city doesn't fit the way that you were growing up doing it? How many of you would be willing to put an end to something that, that God may be moving in because you would rather have the thing that you're used to that for you is more comfortable? It's so easy to be blinded by religious lenses and then stop doing and noticing the things that God wants us to do. These religious leaders, that was their problem. The passage lets us know it was envy and self-interest. How many of you, because of spiritual self-interest, I have the way I like it, I have my preference, I'm comfortable, don't mess with my thing out of self-interest, are willing to ignore the voice of God and his leading, are willing to step back from what he's calling us into, rather than do the things that he's asked as we ask him to rip the lenses off and make us more like him. I had a friend posted something on Facebook this week. I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember the exact words, but it said, it's really interesting that the last healing miracle in Scripture before Jesus dies is the healing of Mal Malchus's ear. So Simon cuts off his ear and Jesus heals the ear. He's like, that wasn't the last time that Jesus was healing people because the disciples were hurting them. We still live in a world today where the church is hurting people. And God is having to do some work in the background to restore the damage that we've done. For many of us, we think we're doing what is right. We think we're standing up for the truth. We think we're honoring God. And in the process, we hurt people and lead them away from Jesus. And then God is having to do this work in the background to try and bring healing to them as he draws them back to him. How many of us, blinded by religious lenses, can look back on our life and see a string of people that we're not talking to anymore, that we've stopped relating to, a bunch of people who won't talk to us because of things we've said and things we've done. How many of us can look honestly at those things and say, it's because I truly spoke the gospel and I exalted Jesus and their heart was so hard against Christ that they walked away. And for how many of the instances can we say, I spoke what was my opinion or my politics, or my theological perspective, and people walked away hurt because of it. So easy to be like the religious leaders in the story. The fourth group of people in the story are just collectively called the crowds. These are the people who blindly follow. They blindly follow Pilate and the religious authorities and what they're called to do. They're blindly following the religious leaders. The passage tells us the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. And then all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. These are people who were Jews who were supposed to be looking for the Messiah. The religious leaders start telling them, this is the wrong guy, ask for someone to be murdered. I tell you, if I stand up here and ask for you to ask for someone to be murdered, please walk out of the doors as quickly as you can. <laughs> Religious leaders should not be hoping for the death of someone else. Uh, we'll leave that in God's hands to sort out that stuff in his timing. But these elders, the elders of the Jewish community, the chief priests and religious leaders, sat with the people and riled them up and convinced them that this innocent man should die because of their envy and self-interest. How far have they fallen? And look at the crowds. What did they do? They went along with it. Did they know the word well enough to stand upon it on their own? Uh, did, did they look at Scripture and say, is crucifixion even one of the things that the law requires us to do when a prophet is not doing what God asked them to do? Did they sit and pray and go, God, what do you want to do in this situation? Or did they blindly follow? How many of us are caught in trouble because we blindly follow? We listen to whatever governments or uh, leadership or um, bosses say to do. 
We look at friends and our circles and we give in to peer pressure and we take, I went home and I researched this and I know there's this thing going on in the world right now and you need to pay attention. Go watch this video. Also happens they only read one article and they didn't even read it. They just read the title. Um, But we go, oh my goodness, I didn't know. And we blindly follow. Are we going to be like the crowds who blindly follow away from Jesus? Or are we going to build the fortitude and the discipline to know the word, to stand upon it, to become sensitive to the voice of God so that when someone asks us or tries to persuade us to walk in a way scripturally that is not okay, or something that's against scripture, that we can stand up and say, no, this is not true. Um, If they read the scriptures, they would know that God hates murder, that God asks us to stand up for the poor and the oppressed, but they blindly followed. Are you studying? Are you reading the scriptures? Are you studying and reading the scriptures more than you're reading other people's comments about the scriptures? Are you seeking God's heart, or are you guilty of blindly following the loudest or most intelligent-sounding voice? The last two characters are fun to look at side and side, side by side. The story sets Jesus and Jesus Barabbas up side by side and in contrast for a reason. So we're introduced to Jesus. We know Jesus the Messiah. Luke tells us, um, we've been reading Matthew, this is what Luke says. I've examined him in your presence. Pilate is talking to the people. I've examined Jesus in your presence and I've found no basis for your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. Jesus, this innocent man, the savior of the world, come to rescue his people. And then we're introduced to this person, Jesus Barabbas. Let's see what Luke says about him. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. So you could consider Barabbas, like, there's, there's two phrases we could translate this as. We could say he's a terrorist, or we could call him an enemy of the state. So let's stop for a minute and just remember what he's doing. He's trying to overthrow the government. He's trying to take out uh, Pilate and Caesar in order to restore the Jews. So what do we call it here when someone tries to assassinate the president and overthrow the government, right? They're not very nice people. <laughs> we, some of you might agree with it, uh, <laughs> but we shouldn't be agreeing with it. He's this, this person. He's known for murder. He's known for stirring up mobs, trying to overthrow the government. And so you have this situation. Pilate is examining Jesus and seeing his innocence. Pilate is interacting with him, and he's trying to question him and put pressure on him, and Jesus stays silent. He's looking at this guy, you're you're here claiming to be the king of the Jews, and we're threatening to kill you, and you're just sitting not saying anything. Like, what is going on? This, This isn't right. People that do this stuff get angry. People that do this stuff speak back. They justify themselves, but Jesus is being quiet. And in this moment, I'm sure it happened like this. His wife comes, gives, like, or the messenger comes, gives the wife's dream. He's looking at the story going, oh, geez, what did I do now? Don't ignore the wife. <laughs> I'll get it later. Uh, and so he's in this moment going, what did I do? And I'm sure he has this brainwave moment. I know. There's this tradition that we can find a person that's in prison and today of all days I'm allowed to set them free, but I have to give the people a choice. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to take innocent Jesus of Nazareth who's been running around healing people and curing the blind and like gathering a fallen and teaching, but he seems to be nice and peaceful and isn't fighting. I'm going to give him him as the option and then I'm going to give him another Jesus, the murderer who's killed half of the people that they know, uh, who's known all over the city for what he's accomplished. Right? It's a no-brainer. Who do you want to release? Jesus, the innocent one that's going to heal people? Or Barabbas, the one that's going to go and murder and try and overthrow the government and get you and a lot of your family killed? And the people incited the crowd to call out the name of Barabbas rather than the name of Jesus. Do you see the heinousness of the moment? One of the commentators I was reading as I was reflecting on this, made a comment. 
that I hadn't thought about before. It's like, imagine Barabbas sitting in his cell, awaiting his crucifixion, because he knows he's about to die. And so he can only hear some of what's going on, because you're in a stone cell with a little bit of noise coming from outside. So what you're not going to hear are the words of the person speaking, but you're sure going to hear the cry of the mob, right? That would make sense. If there's a rally going on in the park over there, we would hear all of the crowd in unison, but we wouldn't necessarily hear the person on the stage talking. And so how does this story go? It says, who do you want me to release? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, the one called Messiah. And the crowd goes, Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. He goes, what do you want us to do with Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. So Barabbas is sitting in prison hearing the words, Barabbas, crucify him, Barabbas, crucify him. I was like, so he's not very happy. So what do you think is going on when he hears a guard coming to the door with keys? And he sticks the keys in the lock and he turns them. And he walks in and says, Barabbas, you're free to go. Jesus of Nazareth is going to be crucified in your place. You know what you've done. You know what you've caused. I'm sure he's seen and heard of this Jesus figure. This person is not fighting and not arguing but is going to die in your place. Do you see the gospel? In theology, we have this doctrine called substitutionary atonement. That in order to wipe our sin away, to wipe the slate clean atonement, a substitute was offered in our place. In this story, we are the Barabbas, the guilty murderer, I'm not sure how many people in the room have murdered someone. If you have, Jesus loves you. His forgiveness is for you. and His redemption can pour over you. But Jesus tells us, whenever you hold anger in your heart towards someone else, you've murdered them. Whenever you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. We are guilty, like Barabbas, of doing Uh, of opposing God in his way, breaking the curse so that Jesus had to come and be sacrificed in our place. Let me finish by quickly wrapping through a couple of the contrasts that are here. We've got Barabbas, this guilty man who was set free. You've got Jesus, the innocent man who was killed in his place. The passage wants us to understand the gravity of this moment and what it means for us. If you're in doubt that this has been set up deliberately and orchestrated sovereignly by God, okay, this next one, let me just pause because I want your mind to be blown the way mine was. And if you've, if you've read this already, then I'm sorry, it won't be as mind blowing. God is orchestrating history in ways that we can't ever understand. He is more sovereign than you realize. And many times it's only when we stop and look back and join the dots that we realize how he's been moving. Anyone know what Barabbas means? So Simon in Scripture is called Simon bar Jonah. Simon, son of Jonah. Bar is the Hebrew or Aramaic word for son of. Jesus, son of Abba. Anyone know the name Abba? So Pilate pulls out this notorious person in the hopes of giving a no-brainer decision that would cause Jesus to go free. And what does he do? Do you want Jesus, the son of Abba, or Jesus, the son of Abba? There's no mistake in this moment, a substitution as the son of God gives himself for one of the sons of God. Jesus Barabbas decides to save Israel by rebelling against the government, by trying to overthrow the system that's in place, deciding I can do this on my own, by myself. Jesus the Messiah decides he can save Israel by submission and surrender and sacrifice, an alternate way to the way of the world. Which one do you walk in? 
the way of rebellion, the way of submission, the way of self-seeking, or the way of self-surrender. The last one, Jesus Barabbas, we deserve to die like he deserved to die. Jesus the Messiah, he died in our place. Pilate gave them a choice. You want Jesus Barabbas, or you want Jesus the Messiah? And he offers us a similar choice. What's the Jesus Barabbas for us? The question becomes, which Savior are you looking to? Jesus Messiah or Jesus Barabbas? What does this look like? Are you looking to Christ to rescue you from darkness? Are you looking at Jesus of Nazareth to be the one to help you overcome your sin, to discern your calling, to define your identity? Or are you looking at something else? What are common saviors that we look at? What are the common Jesus Barabbas moments in Scripture? Do you look to money to provide you the hope and the security that you're longing for? Is it relationships with people? If I can find the right person, then I won't feel lonely anymore and I'll finally have worth. Are you looking at identity? If I can define myself however I want, then I'll finally have peace in this life. Is it perfectionism? If I can just work hard and get everything right and hold all together, then life will be good and things will go the way they're supposed to. For some, it's achievement. If I can just, the next title, the next size of house, the next promotion, the next uh, accomplishment. For some, it's avoidance. My savior is run and hide, don't deal with it. Is it political leaders? Is it government systems? Is it your self-will? Is it controlling the situation? Is it the pursuit of knowledge? Is it pleasing people? Pursuit of pleasure, activism, gluttony, pride, anger, lust, all of these things that we chase in the world to provide something that only Jesus is supposed to provide. And so the Easter story is that Jesus came and he died in our place. The vindication of his innocence happened on the third day when he rose from the grave. God delighted in the perfection of his life, accepting his sacrifice in our place, raised him, Ephesians tells us, raised him to the right hand of the Father and placed all things under his feet. He placed your family issues under his feet. He placed your health issues under his feet. He placed your money issues under, your, under his feet. He placed government problems under his feet. He, he, he took everything and placed it under his feet. Jesus is risen. He is the only Savior that can provide what we need. So back to the question, which Savior are you looking to today? Which of these characters do you see at work in your heart? And if you say that I am wholeheartedly pursuing Jesus the Messiah, stop lying. (laughs) (laughs) We might be trying. (laughs) But what what are the other things that have our heart? What are the other things that stand in the way? Are we willing in the face of loss of power in the face of loss of relationship, in the face of looking ridiculous, are we willing to lay down our life and say, Jesus, I am yours? So I want to give uh, a couple of ways that we can respond. The band are going to come up and we're going to worship some more. And during this time, I've asked a few people to come forward. Uh, I want to invite you to be able to come and respond in prayer. So if something is touching on you in the message, if you're going, yeah, there's definitely some other Jesuses that I'm pursuing, there's other saviors I'm pursuing, you don't need to come up and say, hey, let me confess all my sins to you. But I want you to come forward and just come up to someone and say, hey, would you pray for me that Jesus the Messiah would be the, the, the first and only love of my life? Um, there's, in a room this size, there's probably people here that are struggling with something whether it's illnesses, sadness, depression, relationship issues, money issues, if that's you, come forward. We would love to pray and ask the power of God, the resurrection power of God, to move in your life. And before we get there, I want to offer this invitation. You know, there's people in this room, uh, you are pursuing other saviors. Jesus is not yours. Uh, You have not given yourself to him and you've not allowed him to be the Lord and ruler of your life. And if you're here and you're not confident that you are his and that your eternal security is found in him, 
then I want to ask something of you. So I'm going to have everyone close your eyes, please, just to preserve the, the, the privacy of people. If you just close your eyes for a moment. Jesus is coming for you. This morning as we prayed, there were some things that God put on people's hearts. Someone said, God's saying, be still and listen. We overcomplicate things. We need to start simplifying our lives. Someone felt God was saying, God uses all tools, even the dullest ones. Someone saw Jesus with his arms open, waiting for a hug, and the only thing in the way was ourself. We have to get out of our own way. Someone saw a flock of sheep, and they said they were the bouncy, happy sheep standing in the middle. But not everyone needs to be in the same place. You just have to know you're part of the flock. Someone was talking about the significance of the power of the blood of Jesus and the work that was done for us. Just remember that moment as the crowd said, thinking it was a rejection and a curse. His blood be on our hands and the hands of our children. The blood of Jesus on our life saves us. God's presence is here in the room. So if you're here and you do not know Jesus, if you have not said, Jesus, I want to give myself fully to you, uh, you have a chance so right now. Do you want Jesus or do you want the things of the world? And if you want Jesus for the first time, just ask you to raise your hand and say, Jesus, I want you. I'm just going to wait a moment to give you a chance. Part two, if you're here and you know Jesus and you want more of Jesus, I invite you to stand and say, I choose Jesus the Messiah, not the things of the world. So if that's you, would you stand? I thank you that you're here, that you're working, that you're moving. I pray that you would bless us Lord, those who are far from you, that you would draw them to you, knowing that you alone can save and satisfy. God, I thank you for these people who are standing and the hunger they have to walk more fully with you. May your blessing rest upon them. May you help them to shed the things that stand in the way so that they can run wholeheartedly into your embrace. Jesus, thank you that you're here. Thank you for the work that you did for us. In Jesus' name.